Okay, so this the idea behind this isn't to go into anything um, terribly in depth. I suppose it's just a an introductory type of um, session, and I just called it a sprint in the life because basically it's the the, the main gist is going to be uh, pretty heavily influenced, I guess, from the way that I've been working most recently. And um, there's probably uh, lots of different ways of doing this. Um, and that's uh, possibly uh, encompassed by the following, which should change. So we've got Alistair Cockburn there, who's actually quite quite a good person to, to read into if you, if you want to know a little bit more about Agile practices. But he's saying that it's an attitude, not a technique with boundaries. And an attitude doesn't have any boundaries. So we wouldn't ask, can I use Agile here, but rather, how would I act in an agile way here or how agile can we be here? So although we use frameworks like Scrum and, and various other things, it's important to remember that they're all a sort of guideline on how to be agile. And, and that's really what we're, what we're kind of trying to, to focus on when we, when we take this as, 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 a way, as a way of working. So when we talk about those ways of working, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about Scrum. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to be the Scrum expert. I think uh, Magda knows a lot more about the Scrum Guide and uh, how it works than I do, but we'll talk a little bit about that. So I just put together some things that I think are, are kind of important in terms of how you, how you go through uh, development. So as well as, as Scrum events that are giving us a sort of framework or something to hang everything on um, backlog building. Uh, again, all of these are just high level. Uh, talk a little bit about estimation, which nobody likes to do. Uh, talk a little bit about, about JIRA, the different types of tickets. We could probably do a massive session uh, on JIRA and how tickets could move and how we might, how we might look at things there. Um, and if there's still time, because I'm kind of conscious that we might uh, that we might kind of run a little bit longer, um, we'll look at um, quality and uh, CI/CD. So I think there's a couple of interesting things to to say uh, about about that. So going on to Scrum events. So we've got here at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective and tunes and adjusts its behaviour accordingly. So I think it's important to realize that um, something like Scrum or, or any other kind of agile framework is a, a baseline. It's kind of like your, your go-to, that may be how you start. But as you, as you work through things, you, you more often than not will change uh, how, how things work. Um, the, main, the main principles, I guess, that, that underlie a Scrum team, uh, communication, openness and transparency, so you're looking to have uh, a really open, honest communication between uh, members of the team and just everyone basically working together as much as possible. Uh, you, you don't want to be uh, in silos. You don't want to be uh, apart really in, in any way. It's, it's the, the, the most successful agile working tends to be when, the, when everybody feels you know, that they're very, very much part of the team. So I've put a, a large box in here for the sprint. Uh, the sprint can be any size really, but typical sprint sizes would be uh, a week, two weeks, a month. Uh, the most common thing that I've seen is a, is a two week sprint. I think it gives people time to actually think and plan and achieve uh, an, an, a proper increment in the, in the product without uh, without it just being so long that the, that the milestones start to, to disappear. So in no particular order, um, although maybe in the order of how often they happen to some extent, uh, the daily scrum. So obviously with an STA, the daily scrum isn't necessarily going to happen. But the idea behind the daily scrum would be, say, a 15-minute check-in, uh, typically in the morning, but some teams uh, like to do it in the afternoon or uh, like to do it at, at, at various different times, maybe like it to be the last thing they do in the day. Uh, mostly a developer check-in, 
personally, uh, whenever I've worked in uh, Agile or Scrum teams, the product owner being there is usually uh, a really good thing. Uh, sometimes the, the daily Scrum kind of becomes a, what did I do yesterday? What am I going to do today? And do I have any, any blockers? That's the most basic, I guess, developer level Scrum uh, or, or stand up. But um, I think when the, when the product owner is there and you can maybe get into uh, a little bit of, of, of a conversation or just get some kind of immediate answers, for me, that, that tends to work reasonably well. Although if people start meandering off a little bit, you will hear that lovely phrase, we'll take this offline uh, and, and try and cut people off a little bit. So, you know, trying try to keep it in, in, uh, in some sort of order. But um, generally, it's just, it's just there as a daily check-in for, for the team. Uh, for sprint planning, usually it's informed by the, the backlog, but hopefully it's all nicely uh, groomed in in priority order and everybody kind of knows what they're doing. Tickets are ready to be picked up if they're uh, towards the top of the top of the backlog and they've all been uh, estimated and tidied up and everything's lovely. So when you come to sprint planning, hopefully it should be reasonably straightforward. It's just a case of, well, what do we want to deliver in the next sprint? Um, there's all sorts of things that can, that can influence sprint planning, like the team's velocity, uh, what other tasks they might have, but basically, it's up to the, the product owner to, to set priorities uh, for developers to have, have feedback on the how and whether something's uh, achievable and realistic. And then everyone can agree on how they want to go forward for that sprint and what they're going to uh, try to deliver. At the end of sprint, there's usually the, the bottom two. So you've usually got a sprint review. So we can have a demonstration of people's work. We can look at uh, any working features or have a bit of a, a dig into what's going on. And we can have some feedback that, that goes into the program blog. So it's, it's generally quite an important event. Those demonstrations of work are often to uh, external stakeholders. So this is something where the team may be going to be interacting a little bit more with people outside of the team, as well as, as internally and uh, be able to show what they're doing and, and the progress that they're making, uh, which tends to go down very well with, with people who are waiting for you to, to get all your stuff done. Retrospective, I know we've had a retrospective in the team. Um, retrospectives are, are interesting. I've been to some really, really good retrospectives. I've been to some absolutely terrible retrospectives. Um, the general gist, in fact, we used to do it this exact way. We'd divide a board into a whiteboard into four sections and have a, what went well? What didn't go well? What should we stop doing? What should we start doing? And we would stick post-it notes on whiteboards in all the different sections, and then we would discuss them and, and different things like that. Um, it's, it's quite easy though for things like that to, to get a little bit routine. So it's sometimes quite nice to, there's, there's a million ideas on the internet about how you can uh, spice up your, your retrospective. But the basic idea is let's have a reflection on how the sprint went. If there's been any kind of real success stories, we should celebrate those. If there's been anything that didn't go terribly well, we should have a look at, at why that happened. And you know, we can, we can look at how we're doing things and decide to maybe try an experiment, maybe do something a little bit differently. It just gives us that the idea behind Agile is that the, the team is not just Agile in the sense of what, we, what work we pick up. The team is an Agile team. So we're trying to make sure that we, that we tweak what we're doing so that we can uh, get the best out of ourselves. So going on to, to backlog building, this, this isn't going to be a, a, a terribly in-depth uh, look at this. Um, the, the picture here, as I mentioned already, the picture is grooming, uh, which hopefully is, is picked up on there, because uh, one of the big things that you talk about in backlogs is, is grooming, is regular grooming. Uh, so obviously, a, a, a product backlog is a prioritized uh, list of work for the development team 
derived from a roadmap and its requirements. So what does that mean? It basically means we kind of know what a product is supposed to do. So we try to isolate those in terms of uh, particular features that we'd like to implement. And then we gradually kind of break that down into enough detail that the team can actually pick up pieces of work, know what they're going to have to do, and then go off and get it done. So we tend to start with epics. Epics would be user stories that are basically high level requirements. You're not going to implement an epic directly, but it covers maybe a, a feature or something at a, at a reasonably high level that you're subsequently uh, going to break down. From there, we go into a uh, refinement. So we'll take a story, this, this includes uh, other user stories as well. And the idea is that we're going to work on that story, uh, discuss it, uh, take, take into account everything that we can think of, increase the amount of detail. And the idea is that we would end up with a set of tickets where someone could basically go to that ticket, lift it from the, the top of the backlog and, or top of to-do and go, right, everything that I need to do to implement this ticket is here. Uh, I, can, I don't need any more information. Of course, that's a bit of an idealistic view, but um, it's, it's hopefully where you, where you get to. And stuff like that, for example, um, becomes a little bit more obvious when you look at estimating tickets, because you can't really give an estimate if you don't understand the ticket and you don't know uh, how much is going to be involved in doing that. So some techniques here that I've uh, listed, just a couple, that, that are often used in, in refinement and in, in, in looking at tickets. One is three amigos, which if you are as old as I am, you might recognize that that picture is from a movie called The Three Amigos uh, with uh, Steve Martin and, and others. Um, and Three Amigos is basically where you would have, say, for example, a product owner, a developer, and a tester and they would discuss a ticket. So the product owner might bring the, the ticket to the Amigo session, and you've got a developer who is going to understand the, the how they might be able to do this, and a tester who's going to understand how much effort is this going to take to ensure that, we're, that, that what's being done is, is working correctly. So you could take that, you can work through all the details, uh, develop some understanding, uh, perhaps even uh, at that point, assign the acceptance criteria for a ticket. Basically get that ticket to the point where everyone's had a look and everybody knows uh, what's going on and there's enough detail in the ticket that it can be picked up. One of the ways that you can get towards that in terms of detail is called example mapping. Uh, there's lots of different things that you could do. Uh, but example mapping, there's a, a little uh, picture of that here. So we could start off with a, a high level story. Um, all, all of these things, including, including JIRA, are really based on the idea of whiteboards and post-it notes. Um, so you, you start off with a story, you maybe have some, some rules that um, once the story is implemented, that this will be true. And then you walk through basically some example scenarios. So if it was someone, for example, using the volunteer app, you might actually walk through in terms of the, the green uh, notes that are underneath a rule. You might walk through somebody uh, browsing projects and then drilling into a project, drilling into a resource and finding um, the exact role that, that they want to map to. And sometimes by going through these examples, by walking through effectively a user journey and then asking questions about that, you can basically uh, refine a ticket to the point where, where everyone's understanding uh, increases. There's, I can provide um, some examples on here, but obviously like Google is your friend and there's lots of, uh, there's lots of examples of example mapping. So moving on to estimation, which I've put there as the fine art of guessing. Um, no, I'm not necessarily going to read through all the reasons why we would go, why we would estimate. I mean, basically, if you're if you're working in any kind of industry and you have um, stakeholders, they they always want to know when is it going to be done. 
even in an agile environment, the first question is when when's it going to be done by? And of course, software development is a bit like uh, you know how long is a piece of string? You can never really tell somebody it's going to take this long, but we have some techniques in agile that that, that try to help us. So one of those or two techniques that are kind of joined quite often are using story points and using planning poker. So story points are basically what we would call a relative sizing of a story. So what, what the most common way of doing this is, and it's a bit chicken and egg because this is going to get better as your team, as your team progresses. Because what you would do is you take, say, this, what you think is your smallest story and you say that that is one story point because that's the smallest thing that you would think about about implementing as a story and then every time you come to estimate something you're effectively thinking well how long would it take according to uh, that story so they tend to be done in fibonacci numbers so it tends to be one three five uh, and and so on well one three five eight and thirteen i think are the most common um, and so what we're what we're basically doing there is, is giving things a, a relative size. So we give something a relative size. It could turn out that story takes takes longer, but we're we're again we're comparing as with our experience, we're comparing how long we think a story will take according uh, what relative to the smallest item, the smallest story. So we make some estimates there, and then we 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 put uh, so many story points into a sprint. And then at the end of a sprint, we would measure our velocity. So say, for example, over three sprints, our average velocity was 25 story points. Then as we get better at doing this, as we get better at estimating, as we get more experienced and, we, and, our, and our velocity starts to stabilize, we've got a rough idea of how much we can do in a particular sprint. So when we're planning, we would be saying, well, our average velocity is 25 sprints. Product, you're asking us to take in 40 points worth of work. That's not going to happen. And it also, I guess, gives us a kind of rough idea as well of, of when we can expect to deliver things because we can use it as a sort of forward forecaster. Uh, one of the things that we do for, for assigning those points is, is planning poker, which is just as bad as it sounds if you've never played planning poker. You can play it with physical cards. It's very common to play it on a on some sort of um, web system. So basically, some we we put a, a ticket into planning poker. We all have a discussion until we're confident that we understand exactly what this ticket is and what it means. And then we basically play a card, and the card will typically have a story point number. As I said, usually one, three, five, eight, thirteen. We play our cards. If everyone has the same estimate, bingo, that estimate's written down, saved, job's done. If someone has a higher or lower estimate, we'll talk to the person, figure out why they think it's going to be easier, why it's going to be harder. So sim simulates, uh, simulates, stimulates a discussion. We can uh, hopefully iron out anything that we need to do, and, and then we can we can come up with that estimate. So planning poker. As I say, you actually do get physical decks of cards that you can dole out to people. And they were quite common back in the day when um, when Jira wasn't really a thing and everybody did their uh, sprint planning and, and their, their boards or whiteboards with, with post-it notes. So over to Jira, and I'm almost positive we're not going to get to those, those slides that I said we probably wouldn't get to. So we've all looked at Jira. Uh, the, the scrum board is basically a whiteboard on steroids. So when I, when, when I first started doing things like this, it was really common. I, I went into a, a, a massive room once and the whole room was just, every wall was covered in post-it notes. It was like someone had, had gone and done a Roman mosaic on the wall and God help you if any of those post-it notes fell off during the night. Uh, nobody knew what had happened, what had moved where. It was it was all awful. So now we've got Jira that basically lets us do similar sorts of things. We can have a to-do, we can have an in-progress, we can have an in-test, we can have a done, 
we can have any kind of columns that, that, that we choose to do. So then in, in Jira, what are we putting on that board? Well, we put tickets up and the main ticket types would be uh, user stories, tasks, bugs. We also have subtasks. And because we were speaking about it, I added DOD at the bottom to try and remind myself to have a quick word about the function I've done. So most things are written up as user stories and user stories might end up having subtasks. And typically the type of thing we would want out of a user story is, you know, as a user of the system, I want to uh, volunteer for, or I want to browse a set of projects, for example. And then to determine whether that's worked, we use some acceptance criteria. One of the most common ways of expressing those uh, is what we would call um, given when then. So just as a, as a small example, say we're writing something for a, a vending machine, we could say given there are one uh, coffees left in the machine and I have deposited one pound, when I press the coffee button, then I should be served a coffee. And that basically, we can have multiples of those for a ticket, but it, it, it essentially um, sets out what, what the success criteria is for that story. And generally there's, uh, when, when your tester or when you as the tester uh, come to, to write tests, you would be able to express tests in, in that type of syntax as well. In fact, um, Guest has a plugin, a given when then plugin, so you can write, um, guest tests in, in that syntax. Uh, one of the common ones uh, that's used in Java is called Cucumber uh, and the language that it uses uh, given when then is called uh, Gherkin. Stick with the Cucumber theme. Uh, so it's really common to use that for, for test frameworks. Uh, tasks are really when there's something that just, just needs to be done. It's like just, uh, you know, back up the database or deploy this thing, or do this. It's not something that necessarily, it's not necessarily that it's easy, but it's not, but it's not something that's also um, terribly involved and takes actual development work. Uh, bugs are quite obvious, it's broke, it doesn't work. So bugs become uh, really important. Um, they're also very expensive, which is why we try to make sure that we have uh, acceptance criteria and we've covered all the scenarios because fixing a bug is much more expensive than uh, getting something right in the first place. So ideally we want to uh, get, get it right as much as, as we can. And when we're talking about definition of done, we've all probably seen our definition of done. Uh, basically, and I mean, until something is in production, it's not done, but we can, we can uh, define what we consider a definition of done. If something gets to the point where it is done and we then decide we want to improve it or we decide that maybe it needs to be done a little bit differently, we will create a new story for that. We're not gonna go back and subsequently pull a story out of done and, and put it back in. Um, that might happen if a bug is raised during a sprint, but generally speaking, uh, particularly as, as time's gone on, People talk about fixing things forward rather than going back and trying to unpick or undo things. So we tend to think about creating new work rather than going back and, and trying to put a few things that are there. So it looks like I will maybe get, get at least onto, onto one thing. We'll see how we go. Uh, the, the main part of, of getting all this done, apart from obviously delivering the features that, that we need to get delivered, uh, is, is quality. And there's different ways of thinking about that. But basically, the, the team wants to ensure that it delivers what needs to be done and delivers it in such a way that we can uh, maintain that, that, it, that we can assert that it actually works, that we uh, are not writing you know, code that people are going to come along later and, and just wince every time they look at it. So I've written just a couple of things here that, that can influence quality. One, obviously, is testing. And we've got testing at different levels. The, the lowest level being unit testing, 
moving it up through uh, integration and then end to end, which is obviously like a full system test. And generally speaking, the, the closer we are to unit testing, the faster those tests will run and the cheaper it is to, to write unit tests. The end-to-end -end tests tend to be slower and so have a, a higher cost for the team. So you want to catch something, a problem at unit test level, basically. Uh, so the more unit tests you can put in, the better. Code coverage is, is often related to that. So for example, most development teams, when they commit an MR, or I'm sorry, a pull request, um, will have something that automatically runs tests. And when it automatically runs a test, it will actually also check the code. So it will check the code and say, well, these lines of code were not covered by your test, or these pathways through the code were not covered by your test. And uh, you really are aiming for something very high here. 80% um, coverage um, is something that should probably be a minimum. Um, if, you're not, if you're not testing your code, basically, you don't know that it works. So you, you have to try and get that to be, to be reasonably high. There's other things that you can use as well. So code analysis. I've, I've given two examples here that are, um, to my, as far as I know, quite uh, focused on particular languages. But something like SonarCube and FindBugs are static analysis tools that will actually run over your code and check for common coding problems. Uh, so kind of well-known issues that quite often creep into code. So we're basically trying to eliminate bugs and, and try and catch them in uh, an automated way and try and make sure that they, that they don't progress. One, one new thing, uh, one new, it's not new, but uh, one thing that's becoming uh, a little bit more interesting and, and a little bit more doable these days is uh, called chaos engineering. So say, for example, you have um, multiple services and multiple components, or you have things running on different machines, like a database here and a service over there and whatever. It's quite common to use chaos engineering tools in, in testing now. So for example, you can configure that for so many of your tests. Uh, your database is down. And how did your system cope? So it's not, it's not something that will necessarily pass or fail, but it's something that can inform what might happen uh, in, in different scenarios and um, check basically how resilient your system is, whether it recovers well, uh, various different things like that. Uh, so it's becoming uh, a lot more used. And just because we're here and because I'm going to steal one more minute, I'm not going to talk all the way through this, um, but most teams will be trying to implement continuous uh, integration, continuous development. So we're effectively looking if we possibly could to get to the bottom line of, uh, of this uh, first drawing, the first graph, where we build, we test, we have acceptance tests, they get deployed to some to staging, get tested again, they get deployed to production. And there are, there are many, many places that, that have this working, uh, where basically you build, you do your uh, pull request, and when that gets merged to master, uh, an environment is spun up, the whole thing is run, all the tests are run, automated tests are run. If those tests pass, that's called a, a quality gate. If those quality gates are successful, you basically keep working through uh, stages so that you, you just continuously release to production. Uh, that's, that's becoming uh, much more common. Uh, two other uh, deployment uh, models. Then here we've got blue-green, which is effectively, I have one environment set up, and my, uh, my incoming traffic is all pointing to that environment. In the meantime, I deploy my next release onto the, the green environment, and then I switch it over. So we can uh, change, uh, we can basically make a release without any downtime. The other one is a rolling release, which effectively, say for example, we have um, multiple servers that we're running different, that we're running things on. We might uh, have, we might spin up another one and deploy our new code on there. And then gradually we basically fizzle out the old ones and add more new ones. 
to the point where we now have a completely new uh, code deployed uh, across all the servers of the environment. So that's a really uh, whistle stop tour, I think, of how most of the teams that I've worked in uh, would be approaching their development. And uh, so there isn't really time, I guess, for, for any particular um, questions just now. But um, I'd be more than happy to um, talk to anybody about, about any of it. And if there's any suggestions about delving into more things, like, for example, what, what do people typically do in terms of JIRA workflows? Or, or how do you get to the point where you, like what's involved in getting to the stage where you are automatically releasing every time you develop uh, or push code? Then be happy to, to talk about that at a future time. Uh, Peter, there are, uh, Peter, thank uh, you. Uh -huh. <laughs> there are a couple of questions. Um, if you wouldn't mind, kind of having a very quick look. There aren't very many, so if you wouldn't mind, just no, that's okay. answer that. If I can get the right slack, I've got four slack workspaces. <laughs> well, so, no, so no, Peter, no, one, this one is in chat. Four. Yeah, yeah, one of the ones I you, you use the term velocity, velocity rather, and mm. it's it's one we haven't used so far in the volunteer app. If you see it. Ah, okay. Um, okay. So from for velocity, what we're basically talking about when we talk about velocity is the number of story points you can get through in a sprint. So what we tend to have is um, we'll have a, a certain number of stories that have a number that have story point estimates against them. And if we managed to do, say, three stories that all had five uh, story points, then our velocity would be 15. So then when we get to the next sprint and we're looking at planning those in, we can look at the stories that are there and we can know that 15 was our velocity. And so if we're trying to take in 25, we're probably going to have a problem. So it helps kind of inform uh, how, how, we might, how we might go ahead. It's, it, story points being relative sizes are generally better than trying to say, for example, it'll take three days, it'll take five days, it'll take a week, uh, stuff like that, because um, it, it, it's generally uh, more effective. Um, but what it does mean is you kind of have to make a start somewhere. And this, as a process, tends to get more accurate as the team progresses rather than from the word go. So, uh, yeah. So, so as a as a management team or a product mm. owner in the scrum, you're trying to work out how fast people are getting through the work, basically. Yeah, so, but also how I guess it's also it's really, I, I, I think what it's handier for really is just to kind of have estimates. It's it's really handier for sprint planning, I would say. You, yeah, you, you but, will, but that's you why. So, a, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. so once you know how much people can do you what you don't want to do with this is kind of pile on loads of work and people keep failing to deliver the goal of the exactly, sprint exactly yeah so because sp sprints tend to work really well when you can actually get to the end of a sprint and go we did that you know we go achieved let's uh, you know knock that down and and the morale's up and everyone's like hey and it's all groovy if things just kind of continually roll over or, or you feel like you're not really progressing anything, it, it tends to get a little bit um, demoralizing, I think. So it's, it's good to have a, 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 an idea of, of what you can do there. Um, and related to that is Magda's question about story points, looking at dev or also testing. Uh, definitely also testing. So it's not uncommon, for example, to a developer who always tend to think optimistically and go, yeah, it'll take, like, this is a three-point story. And then the tester comes along and says, hey, whoa, wait a minute, I've got to do this, I've got to set this up, I've got to get this thing running, I've got to do all of that. And so then it becomes, well, actually, this is a five or, or an eight-point story um, because you're really, you know, you're looking at, at everybody's, uh, it's basically how long or what's involved in getting that to done basically. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, covers testing. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Sorry, this is a longer question from Joe, so I'm just trying to read it properly. Um, Sorry about that. No, 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 it's I all right. summarise if it's helpful. 
Go on then. That's a good question. <laughs> um, so briefly, this is only the second time I've worked with Agile. The other time was in an organization. And <laughs> based on your presentation just now, I'm not sure they used it very well. Um, it wasn't very kind of open and communicative and um, like collaborative, which I think is what you're talking about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. felt that the the ticket system kind of inadvertently reinforced that. It's like you go, all oh, right, I've mm -hmm. got my job for the week or the next few days. I just go away, stick my headphones on and I do it. And then mm -hmm. I kind of, and yeah, there was the stand up and everyone would kind of mumble quickly what they did yesterday and what they did today. And then everyone went off, you know, yeah. like their separate ways. And I guess I just wondered, uh, obviously it doesn't have to be like that, but um, I feel in some ways you almost have to, my impression is you have to kind of almost work against that because a ticket can make it seem like I'm doing a separate thing from everyone else. So I was wondering if you had any tips about mm -hmm. how to do it well. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of interesting because when, when Agile was first proposed, people were very, very like strict about what an Agile team was going to have to be, right? So an agile team was going to be an autonomous team. It was going to be like every everything it needed was going to be in the team. So you were going to have a product person who could give you requirements and could answer business questions. You were going to have developers. You were going to have testing. You were going to have basically everything you needed was going to be in that team. And everybody, when it, when it was first used, said, and that team must sit together uh, in a little pod. They're going to be talking to each other all the time. Like communication is going to be, you know, the absolute, you know, mantra for, for these teams. And of course, as things like tools and, and stuff progressed, um, that, that started to change. Because, I, I, I mean, I'm not, I, there are probably, there are probably people here who think I'm joking about whiteboards and post-it notes. And, but if you, but that is what, that's what boards used to be like. Boards used to be, and, and there, used, there used to be teams who would be adamant, like, even if we have a Jira board, I want a physical board. We are going to take a ticket and we are going to move a ticket and we are going to be, you know, we're going to be there and, and, and doing it together. And I think it, it, it was designed to, to work when, when that communication was, was in place all the time. Yeah. And what, what, team, what tools have given us, in a way, is they slightly break down that communication. So I think the, the communication is absolutely key and, and really important. And I think some of those some of those other techniques and tools that we were talking about briefly, like um, example mapping during refinements and getting lots of people involved, those are the kind of things that hopefully get us all communicating and, um, and keep that communication up. Yeah, I, I think, Joe, you also tend to see it where people don't really understand what they're building. So, so quite often when you don't understand what you're doing, you'll lean on the process because effectively mm. Jira is just a visual display of the process effectively. So that, that kind of heading down, you know, so it's really important when, you, when you're talking about what you're doing, you actually say what you're doing, not just Jira ticket five. So I, you know, I'm actually pulling back this data and this is why, because the whole point of telling everybody is that somebody goes, oh, shit, I need to know that. Oh, I might need to change my bit. Otherwise, we don't need to know. We could all quite happily go down a run lane and finish, you know, so so that communication. So that's often where the product owner and the scrum leader really need to be pulling people back to what are you actually doing? And it, it happens a hell of a lot. It happens when people rabbit hole into the tech of what they're doing and get really excited about what they're building. But that's that pull it back and right, talk to me in plain language. Because otherwise, the minute you go back in front of a client, you're talking gobbledygook to them and asking if they like something. And quite often you'll find that playback to the client. They go, oh, no, this isn't what I wanted at all. So, you know, it, re it really is important remembering that Jira is just the tool. It doesn't build the code. It doesn't review the code. It doesn't make the person sitting on the other end of the phone understand what the hell you're doing. Um, but it it can help with a okay, you know, get some basics going sort of thing. Um, the good the good thing about the good thing about physical boards used to be that people actually had to go up to the board, point at the thing that had the ticket number and the summary of what they were doing, talk about it, and hopefully 
actually take that and move it like in front of everyone and introduce like a certain amount of um, accountability as well and and you know you you actually wanted to to be moving things along along the board and, and stuff like that and, and and everyone was there i think sometimes the tools give us a little bit of a of a disconnect but especially the way that we work you know we're not physically located together etc um, yeah. but, it, but it's a bit it's a bit like the difference between i don't know um talking to someone face to face and uh, trolling them on the internet um you know you, you you had these really good ways of working that were designed to work in a very kind of collaborative way and it's really important to to keep that in mind when you're working with any of these tools they are just tools but they're there to kind of facilitate that that collaborative process and mm. they're not there to kind of remove you from it so it takes it takes a lot of discipline i think uh, for people to to remember that but it's really really important yeah. and and i think now as a team we're in a really good place because there's enough of us there's enough done that you know if there were anything that peter particularly went through we like i'd like to have a go at that as part of this so you know the whole point of getting steve looking at the research around the search stuff is that we can do that walkthrough of the user stories talk about how it should work eyeball each other and go right i understand what the success criteria are now how does that actually translate into when I'm coding? And actually, do I understand enough? And it's fine to say, I don't know how to do this bit because then that's where you you talk about it and, and work it out. It's not a just, I've, I've put it out for a review, but I haven't got a clue <laughs> whether it's gonna work or not. And that's where that collaboration and that open comms build stuff. And, and the more you do it, the more fun it is and the more you want to do it. So it is a nice loop that kind of, leads to really good code really good stuff um because that's when you get the oh i found this and what about and you know yeah absolutely so i know that means that we've probably run kind of away over time but hopefully it was interesting and it wasn't kind of too high level and it wasn't kind of uh, definitely giving you something to, to do when you prepare <laughs> <laughs> that was you unprepared bloody hell <laughs> uh, well i i did it 